Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to now join you for the last panel discussion. And we'll be talking, as I said, about the implications of the war in Ukraine. Alexander Rodinyansky gave us a very impressive statement showing us what it's all about in this part of Europe, which is right in our backyard. I can say that as an Austrian. And what is happening there right now? We have a wonderful panel today from Convoco Veterans. And I'd like to introduce the panel. To my left, Professor Monika Schnitzer. She is an economist at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. She is a member of the German Council of Experts in Berlin. And next to Monika Schnitzer, we have Professor Leonhard from the University of Freiburg. He is a brilliant global historian. He's read written books about the First World War, Pandora's Box, and it was at the Harvard University Press, and then at the end of the war and talked about the post-war system and all of the problems that resulted from that. To my right, Professor Claudia Wiesner. She is a political scientist and she has the chair at the Jean Monnet at Fulda University. She spent some time as a visiting scholar in Harvard. And then right to Claudia Wiesner, we have Professor Sven Simon, who's a member of the European Parliament and also a professor and legal expert. So it's interdisciplinary, our panel today. He's a professor for international law, European law, and public law at the Phillips University in Marburg. We've talked about a watershed a number of times, and we've talked about different changes. And now we have a global historian with us on the panel. What is this watershed moment? Are we now entering a new era? Have we really reached that point as of the 24th of February? Was that something we could see coming? How did it all happen? Well, eras can be defined when history has cooled down and the history is now still very hot. The term of the Ancien Regime was the French Revolution when it was it had been over for a long time. And then you could talk about the long-term consequences of the revolution. Since 1989 now, this is something that has not been as perceived as the people did back in 1820 or 1830. So I would say what we do know is the security that we have lost and may still be lost. But when we talk about long-term implications of this turning point, I think I would be very cautious about making conclusive forecasts. Right now, we're going through a really extreme situation when it comes to vocabulary. We talk about genocide, international law, all of the crisis terminology that we used in the 1930s, Munich appeasement, etc. As a historian, I would say we have to take a look at all of this with a certain amount of sobriety. So it's a changing, a turning point, a lot of indications that a lot of certainties have gone lost. And no country is going to be affected more by this than the Federal Republic of Germany. But the system that will result, and we need that when you talk about different errors and putting a label on them, then I would say, just as Mr. Wittig said, this new system cannot yet be recognized. We're looking for the terms because with the shock of the uncertainty and all of the expectations that we had, we're going to have to deal with, learn to deal with all of this first. So we know or we expect that something has come to an end with this war, but we know more than what is going to happen in the future. We're in a state of limbo right now, historically speaking. But the attack 
and the violation of international law is something that is not being called into question. We had a long period of time where the borders were considered constant and permanent. Not always, but we had this for a long period of time. So the question is to Claudia Wiesner, what does that mean? And how can we imagine international law in the future? Are we leaving this era of security? When they talked about Hobbes and Kant that was prepared, now we're talking about, what, what, what can we say about that? Can you hear me okay? Right. Well, I think that this image that we're being in a situation where we can see a very major change from a political point of view. Hobbes was the theoretician who talked about the different situation and war, everyone against everyone, the stronger. And Kant was the philosopher who we not only see in political sciences with a world system with eternal peace. So my theory is that in the last 30 years in the West or in the global North, if you like, we've seen growing belief in everything being solved by the UN, by different agreements and firm belief in rule of law, more and more UN conferences, and especially Russia. But the situation worldwide is showing us that the, this is something that has reached an end point and it will not continue as it has been. And I agree, we don't know yet. We're faced with a situation where we have much more hops in the world, Macron in Africa. So what they're trying to do is to get by in a different way rather than the idealistic image that we had. But I would say that this is a major turning point and I would say it is a watershed because especially for the EU, we can say that Europe is going to have to change. Otherwise, it will leave, lose even more of its significance worldwide. So I also agree with Mr. Leonard. What exactly the result of this all will be is something we cannot say yet. But I think we talked about this over the last couple of days. The war is not going to be over all that quickly. So this question of uncertainty is going to last even longer. And there will be something different at the end of the day, I assume. So when we talk about Professor Simon now, when we talk about the EU and the United States, South Korea, Japan, we saw the map that Mr. Vidic showed us. We've come up with economic units, military aid, and also... The only thing we have is this old world system, which is involved in different problems now. In other words, violation of international law, penalizing this is not enough. We have to send off clear cut messages. Does that suffice? Is that enough? Do we have, does Europe have to do even more? The EU is not doing enough. In Germany, there is no structured discussion on what needs to be done and what can be done. And that question was raised before. Can we do more? We have to do more. That's obvious. And this is also something that was clearly expressed in the requests for aid on a day-to-day -day basis from Ukraine. We see that they don't have the weapons they need and that the Ukrainians are fighting so bravely for us. So we have to ask ourselves the following question. If on the one hand, we believe that our system, our peace are being defended, but the Americans are doing so much more than the Americans, than the Europeans are doing, especially where there is a lot more needed acutely, especially weapons, maybe we should stop and think about this in the longer term. But this is nothing new, actually. How are the Europeans going to uh, come up and be able to play a role and take action? Are we not supplying enough weapons? I've discussed this with some colleagues, and I've read articles on this in the press with request to how Ukraine is going to pay their 
debts. And we're talking about an economic crisis in Russia. We'll talk about the cost of the sanctions for us here. But in Ukraine, it's not only a disaster for the Ukrainians. People are dying. Buildings are being destroyed. The infrastructure is being destroyed to a vast extent. But for Ukraine, it's also an economic disaster. There have been discussions on reconstruction. I think that's a bit early for that right now. But we haven't heard much about the financial means we can give to Ukrainians so that they can continue to import things. For example, military equipment to very specific items, food or pharmaceutical products. Don't we need to do even a whole lot more in Europe? Can't we do a whole lot more? Well, I think, yes, we can. This is a discussion which is a bit grotesque. We're talking about a Marshall Plan and how this can be financed for Ukraine. And we're assuming somehow that Ukraine will continue to exist. First of all, we have to talk about how can we support Ukraine to continue to exist, and then we can talk about the Marshall Plan. So my proposal, which we in the European Parliament have introduced, is to have a European Land Lease Act, which is similar to the World Second World War. This was the act which is now being reconsidered again with a much higher budget and loans more than the Europeans have issued, this would involve two things. First of all, the European peace facility, two or three billion would need to be increased significantly. So the Ukrainians would have the possibility to have an unlimited loan during the war. And the second important part would be for exports, military exports from certain regimes would be exported so they wouldn't have to be, go begging to Berlin for whatever reason why it takes so long until the federal government reacts. They're reacting too late and not enough. This is simply that we really cannot understand. And we have to consider the other European partners and the member states. It's hard to make it clear what Germany is up to here. So we said that Germany is especially shocked by all of this, but nonetheless, the others even more. The Baltic states, for example, they have physical fear, the Poles as well. And that's why something has happened where we have to work on for a long time in the European Union. In other words, Germany will have to react to the concern of the Baltic states and the Poles. Nonetheless, the uh, Germany is still so dependent on energy. That could be one reason why we're not doing more. And the second reason could be that we cannot do any more because nothing more is there. Because NATO has certain requirements on our ability to defend ourselves. That's a reason why we can't do more. It's not clear why we can't do any more. The government does not explain why they don't do more. As an economist, I would say it could there could be certain french restrictions we don't have the arms that need to be delivered they have to be produced and we can't do that all that quickly which is probably always something granting credits is not always that's maybe easier but one thing that especially concerns us in germany and in europe is that you're afraid of not getting russian gas here in europe and this would lead to even greater economic distortions. Recession is a word we kept here. We keep hearing. It's not all that much right now, but we keep hearing about it. So the question is: the sanctions that exist and the countermeasures from Putin, how will they affect us, and to what extent will they also affect us compared to how the sanctions affect Russia? Well, you can see that less gas is being delivered. This was less than before the war, so that we are affected by this. And here we can see this dependency is the problem. Maybe we should say this is something that Germany as a whole did. It's not just the German government, German companies who benefited from this to a great extent and weren't against getting cheap gas. So what we can see when now that we're getting less gas, this really hits us economically so we can be pleased for every bit of gas we receive so that we can prepare for this better. But we also see that these preparations 
are only possible to a limited extent. At least it takes time. We've tried to come up with alternative sources, liquefied gas, and we're also trying to consider how we can save energy. Considerations are ongoing, but this all takes preparation. At the same time, we also see that you can't just select this or he or she or they should get it. We don't have the infrastructure. We can't simply say households will not get gas for three hours a day and they'll get a little bit more here. For example, it simply doesn't work, technically speaking. So this is where we really have to stop and think carefully about how we can prepare for this in order to get through the next winter. It will be difficult and we will if this continues to worsen when it comes to gas deliveries, that is going to lead to a recession. And this is in a world and an economic situation where in the United States, the economy has cooled down considerably as well. And in China, we can see that their zero COVID strategy also had a major impact negatively on the economy. So everything looks to me like a difficult situation difficult situation associated with this, with the sanctions. And maybe it's not 100% correct. We have an uh, increase in the interest rates, which is reducing growth. This is not all due to Russia policy, but it's not going to be easy to maintain the sanctions if this leads to major reductions. Now, what we're concerned with now and what we wanted to discuss today and yesterday as well we talk about a weaponization of interdependence. In other words, making use of economic means and political influence in order to have an economic war. Mr. Leonhardt, I think that was always part of the power that wars wanted to achieve. What do you think about this? Well, of course, what you say is right. In antique times, there was an idea of destroying cities, burning grain. We had the continental blockade. And as a reaction to, that's not me, that's not my phone that's ringing, as a reaction to Mussolini's war, this was also economic sanctions that were attempted there. But the decisive point here, and I think this is something that we can really clearly see, is that wars have a different development over time as opposed to economic or financial sanctions or global flows of energy resources and the struggles for distribution that result. In Ukraine, it's now a question of conventional artillery duels. This reminds us of wars in the 19th or 20th century. We thought that modern Wars are only cyber wars, but now we can see that space is coming back, re-territorialization of war. But at the same time, this war is also a cyber war, a media war, an economic war, financial war. And all of this is being used as a possible weapon in war, gas, distribution conflicts. Putin is doing nothing more than just seeing how resilient democracies are when they really come under stress. That is the resilience test, the stress test, and all of the other wars are resilience tests. What's new about this war, for me, historically speaking, is the major acceleration, the rapid pace at which this is happening, and the global aspect of how this is all happening. So that means that we're now faced with being reviewed to see how many parallel crises societies can deal with at the same time. Corona, war, inflation, distribution, economic future. So this is really a lot of things coming together. I'm very cautious when I talk about a new area, but this, historically speaking, is a singular time. And they're all, every victim is a real shame, but it's the type of war. If you think about Milosevic in the 1990s, there we also had neo-imperial thoughts, but the 
global nature of this and the pace at which many things are happening. This is something which I believe is something new. And for me, what's interesting here, and I think this is also something that will be a very decisive factor, is how will we deal with this war? And this is the different times. What about resilience of the West if this war were to last 10 years or if it lasts 15 years? At the end of the day, it could mean that we're dealt with, that we'd be dealing with a phase of escalation, de-escalation, a hybrid of war between different nations or ethnic problems. Does our economy work well enough so that we can deal with economic and financial sanctions, or can we deal with such burdens? That's the test that we're undergoing right now. And this is unique in history, a stress test of our societies. Let me ask the political scientists, have we, are we in a good position with our discussions? We're talking about whether autocracies are better at dealing with crisis than we are. And then we also looked at the corona crisis, the zero COVID policy in Beijing was not all that great either. But now we can see a strong guy as leader with their whole apparatus. Maybe they can take more action in such a crisis. Well, I think, no, that is not the case. And we, if you take a look at the pandemic, it says very clearly, some studies say that it is not clearly shown that auto autocracies work better. In China, you can lock up the population for four months and then let them out. Okay, that contains the pandemic more than if you protect certain uh, rights and see how long some of this is going to last. But in a midterm perspective, you can see that China is not in a better position when it comes to dealing with the pandemic. Institutions, are, our institutions are not all that bad in the Western world. And I would like to say that the problem is not so much the institutions, even if the they do have problems in efficiency. Something has to go through parliament. It takes longer. Vladimir Putin can just sign on the dotted line and everything is done. But I think it's a different problem that we're faced with. And that's a question of democracy versus autocracy. The problem is more the fact that democracies are more prone to, we've talked about inequality. We didn't really talk about inequality in all of the Western uh, democracies. We see that the efficiency has increased in the past 15 years. There's a lot of potential for social, for lack of peace, social peace. And it's quite clear that this development of populism in Europe is related to all of this. So now we see that crises are then uh, making everything even worse. We had a financial crisis, which increased social inequality. We had a pandemic, which hit the poorer people, in particular women, harder. Now we've got the war, we've got the climate crisis, and this is also beginning to show major impact in Southern Europe and also in Germany. So this is all cumulative. So I think it's not so much a question of how long the institutions will hold up to this, but what about social peace? And this is where I see a certain risk. And the final point I'd like to make, when we talk about gas prices and inflation, this hits those people who have the least amount of money I read something in the Süddeutsche newspaper that said that in the East, it's not only the AFD, but the, uh, the other right-wing parties that are preparing for October when people are no longer able to pay their costs for heat. This, this is what we have to consider. So I think that this is a very, very dangerous potential. So the crises are not so much a threat for the institutions, but more for what we can see in the potential for protests. So this is very interesting. And Monica, the question for you is, how are we going to position ourselves in domestic policy so that we can be powerful in foreign policy? That's an exciting question. What do we need in our conflict with Russia? The gas prices have gone way up. We have also seen some strong domestic efforts. These could be done away with. So what do we need to do 
in order to really avert these distortions. A reduction for the gas prices or food. I don't know what the answer is. So I, uh, have we taken the right policies? What do you think? How are we going to manage this in domestic policy? Well, I think we need three things. First of all, the prices have to be passed on. Energy prices have gone way up and we have to save. I think that is what we need to do. Otherwise, we won't make it through the next winter. So people have to experience these prices. And I think we have to pass on these prices. But at the same time, there are people who are really at their limits and they won't be able to pay for the gas. So we can't say we're going to turn off their heat. No, so we'll have to see how we can help those who really cannot afford to pay the bills. How can we make it possible for them to eat their apartments? There are different possibilities. You can give them money for heating. You can give them a certain amount, like what we compared to what they consumed last year at a cheaper price. But then the full price has to go through so that everyone will have motivation to say, turn down your thermostat. So those are people that we have to help, the poorest of the poor. But I also think we have to make it very clear that not we don't have to help everyone. I don't think we here up on this panel need to be helped. And I think there are a lot of other people who don't need to be helped who might earn somewhat less than we do. I think we have to be very open here. There won't be as much money for Christmas presents, not as much money for vacation because our country has become poorer. We're paying high energy prices because we import energy. We also pay to the U.S. It's not only Russia that we pay for our energy. So we have become poorer, we, Germany. So all of us will have to pay for this. And this expectation that everyone will be helped People who drive SUVs, they get reduced prices for gas. I think that's crazy. We can't do that. So I think this is where we have to be very open and say, this country has become poorer. We have to go through it together. So maybe we will benefit from the fact that this conflict is being forced upon us. That means that gas, less gas, and then we can say, okay, we'll have to go through this together. We need solidarity. And I think we also have to appeal to everyone to stand together. And maybe in this short period of time, if we take a look at climate goals, then, of course, leaving gas is something, or exiting gas is not something that would be expected in several years, but it's on the agenda. Maybe this can speed up to a certain extent, and this would have been necessary no matter what. So that is exactly one of the silver linings that I have. First of all, we need to make more rapid progress with renewables, and we can also see that maybe there will be fewer problems with how much uh, the distance has to be to the wind park. I really hope that this will lead to some rethinking. That's one hope that I have. And the second one I have, and this is something we've seen in other crises as well, after the oil price crisis, and that was that people become creative. And they'll be innovative so that they can conserve energy. And maybe they can be working more efficiently with this energy. And there have also been some wonderful appeals in Japan. They said one up, two down means up one flight of stairs. Okay, I won't take the elevator two down. If it's just two going down, I won't take the elevator if it's just two flights of stairs. So I think with these appeals, you really can also get our people to deal more efficiently with energy. And I think there is some potential out there. And economists would say appeals are wonderful, but at the end of the day, these signals, these messages with regard to the prices, and this message has to come across. And I think that this is also true. The question of distribution has to be taken very seriously because if it leads to political changes, this will mean that it will no longer be possible to continue with the Russian policy that we've started because it might become unpopular. And we have to see what happens if the French elections had turned out differently, etc. So this is something where we have to consider in terms of domestic policy. And what about domestic policy and foreign policy? And we saw that before the Ukraine war, 
and we talked about an anti-coercion instrument on the European level, and we talked about different sanctions and automatic sanctions. What do we need to do? What kind of instruments, instruments at EU level do we need? We have a great weight, economically speaking, when it comes to world trade. How can we better implement this in a world where, once again, it's a question of power and power interests? Well, maybe one way of handling the situation is to save resources, for instance. The second item is, and I'm not really seeing this in the society, meaning to wake up. Because, you know, this is the first time that there's a generation who does not know what war is all about. It's quite far away. But nevertheless, we have a war in Europe. And maybe we will see more pictures, images, which will make it clear to us to think clearly about the way to defend ourselves, the capability to defend ourselves. Now, all this can start or should start with a discussion with this, which is less Eurocentric. I think that was in March, April. I, w I went to Serbia. And if you go there and if you say, well, this is the first war on the European uh, territory after the Second World War. Then they say, well, I think you overlooked something. Next point is, I think Mr. Wittig mentioned this in his presentation. I went to Bangladesh like, last week. The question, where, you know, do the situation, the, the, the hunger crisis come from? Sanctions of the Europeans. And Putin's is really conducting a very good propaganda war, so to speak, and we haven't got anything to say against it because the Europeans have, have always been very weak. We spend a lot of a lot of money, whether or not uh, we use it cleverly, well, that's a different kettle of fish. But if you think about Africa, so everything says USA. But now the question which we have to ask ourselves is, and I hope that this is a kind of wake-up call, meaning the European really get their act together, become active in those areas where they can do things. This means they have to become independent of energy supplies. We will not be independent from one day to the other. We will always be dependent on something, hydrogen, for instance. We have to get it from somewhere. And all in all, we will not be self-sufficient, you know, when it comes to rare earths, other, other commodities, raw materials, whatever. And the second uh, part or item is the ability to defend ourselves. And what we do is grotesque. 128 weapon systems are in existence, the Americans, 28 or 30. So I can say that they are much more efficient and we spent half as much as, as they do, but we are hardly effective. You know, there are just two countries, Germany and France, uh, who've got a major weapons industry. But if we do not overcome, say, gaps, ditches, it's not like with Airbus or other predecessor models. If we do not manage to do European defense uh, policies or politics, it's not only about weapons, it's about cybersecurity, it's about security as a kind of global term. And you know, the Europeans can handle that only together, having joint ranks. And we have to identify areas where we can make progress so that others are dependent on our technologies, but not the other way around. And as long as the, the Europeans do not understand this, they will play no role whatsoever, and so others will tell us what to do. And this brings me to patent protection, you know, these vaccines. Uh, it's not about supplies, it's not about God knows what. The political debate was completely dodging the issue, even in the European Parliament. But the Indians or South Africa, they submitted the application. You know, they succeeded to uh, open the window a little bit, the box of Pandora, Pandora's box, to say, well, we've got a market of 1.456 million people a billion people, sorry, and now you can decide, you Europeans, whether you want this market or the, or the Chinese come in. And this applies to everything in the context of trading. 
So if we now fail to see a domestic market and use it as strategic weapon in negotiations, also in talks with India like this one, then I can say we will fall back further and further. But we still have a chance that this doesn't happen. Now, trade agreements. You see, there's a long-standing discussion what we want. Do we really say defined incentives in economical terms? Do we want to real give advice or do we want something completely different? Meaning we want to push human rights, we want to push the environment. So the question is always about our values, our interests, Mr. Leonhardt. You see, this is also a discussion which is certainly not a new one, which has been around for, for, for decades. But what do you think? What do you think is necessary, no matter whether this is a, a sea change or, or, or a change of times, what can we do? Let me add one point. We were talking about the d Democrats and the autocrats. As an historian, I would say wars are always kind of moments in which autocrats tend to surround them Themselves with people who tell them what they want to hear and they decouple from reality. And add to that what Mr. Wittig said, you know, the checks and balances in an autocratic system. Autocratic systems are less likely to learn or less able to learn. And this, with a view to all the problems, and this is the advantage of liberal democracies. Yes, cumbersome, tiresome. But looking at the world wars, that it is certainly not a coincidence, and you can give reasons and causes that they that there have been systems which have won these wars, and I think I can say that for the Second World War as well. Close bracket. The problem is, and we touched on this this morning, the buzzword was the West will fail because of a lack of expectation management, so to speak. Say, what can a state do in times of such a crisis? And what do I have to communicate what a state like this cannot do in times of a crisis? Financial crisis, coronavirus. And this means we've got the rising expectations to be met by the country, by the state, that is. The majority of the German politicians tell the Germans problems will be solved. And everyone has got the feeling, if I communicate here, and this is what Mrs. Schmitz has said, you know, if I don't say this, then I will not win the next election. And this is a problem of crisis communication. And the second example referring to this foreign policy and what peace can bring about. And I warn about, you know, placing too many expectations on this piece. I wrote a book about Versailles saying the overtaxed peace. Paris peace from a German perspective failed, that is the, the Versailles peace, failed because it was supposed to do everything, create a new world order to bring about a value-based foreign policy, you know, League of Nations, all wars, uh, you know, independence and self-determination of, of states. In this context, ambivalences grow for the Poles, for the South uh, Slavs, but for other for other countries of the Southwest uh, of the of the global South. Here, the situation is different. We have to say very soberly what a peace can bring about, and this brings you to two elements: interests and rules. And I really warn to, you know to metastasize these two things to such an extent, meaning that peace can do everything. We talked about the Marshall Plan and uh, the support we got. But, you know, at present, it's still not clear what Ukraine will be after the war. You know, while the war is going on, we are talking about things like, you know, we talk about things like this, but I think we should, you know, rethink. Uh, I believe this is a very... Um, say good advice. The time you know is running. Monica Schnitzer, a last item I'd like to address: state government overtax. Too many expectations to be met by a government, but nevertheless, many believe that we need the government, the state, in times of a crisis, 
in a kind of uh, financial crisis, let's call it this. What about our structures? Is the German state, the European Union, the Austrian state, are they in a position to do justice, to handle, to manage these crises? And what can they do? Now, what we see in this crisis is that we, Europe, have to stick together. An individual country will not be able to handle all this. We have to expand our domestic uh, market, the internal market. And this is something which we have to push, if you like, looking around the world. Where can we get the commodities, the raw materials, the energy sources? Here, we have to say act as one. And all the differences in Europe, we have them, yes, but we have to overcome them. And this is certainly not an easy task. But if we don't manage to do so now, then I really don't know. If we do not manage now, then I don't know when. You see, I'm an optimist. And I hope we will manage, I think. But nevertheless, we really have to get our act together. I think we should get our act together, also looking at the time management. Thank you very much, uh, Claudia Riesdam and Gwen Schlitzer and Mr. Uh, Mr. Leonhardt. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you.